My name is Victoria Gilbert, and I am the Modern Language Chair at St. David's School, an all-boys elementary school in New York City. I would like to share with you some of the routines and planning tips we use for our FLESS program. I hope you find them helpful. Welcome to my submission for the Greater Washington Association of Teachers of Foreign Languages. I would like to share with you some ideas for taking your students from input through intake to output. In other words, how to organize your planning so it just flows. One of the main problems I have observed for teachers of FLESS is that they have little time planning with multiple preps across a wide range of ages and sometimes hundreds of students. I believe the solution is to streamline planning with routines and templates, investing time up front, instilling those routines with students, creating a system that allows you to layer new content while reviewing the old and using checks for understandings within the activities. Let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean. Routines can be songs, stories, or games. They're important because they lower the affective filter, helping our students to take chances and use language without even thinking that they're doing it. Routines usually have a beginning, middle, and end. It could be a whole class routine, it could be a song that you've used, or a story pattern that you've adopted, or a game. And most importantly, these routines can allow for differentiation and experimentation on the fly so that teachers can adapt to the student conditions in the moment. Here is a tool that I came up with to help me and support me in my own planning when I was trying to keep track of every class, where we were, what we were doing, and what would be coming next. In my school, we use a great deal of games. It's an all-boys school, and this is something that they respond to in particular. Some of the games are competitive, and some of them are more about the teamwork involved. Most of all, I choose the games that have a way to level up because our students really respond to that. It's also helpful when you have heritage speakers in the class, those that are farther ahead from the novices, because it gives you a chance to include them and let everyone play together. So here you can see that the magic hat or box and other activities in the white part of the spectrum only require that students demonstrate their understanding by pointing, lifting, or lowering, holding up, or otherwise using TPR to communicate. In other words, the games just require student movement to participate. No language has to be produced. Heritage speakers in this case can be the callers or the leaders of the game. Some of these games will have to be adjusted for the online environment or restricted movements in the classroom. For example, moving closer and farther away from the camera is one tweak some teachers have made to stimulate stronger agreement or disagreement with a prompt. Others can limit the movements to a jump to the left or the right, forward or back, around a desk spot. As the exposure to the input moves on, the activities and games that you see in the gray area invite group play and response. If you'd like more information about the specifics of each game, you can email me so that I can share documents that describe these in detail. Many of them rely on guessing or repeating a phrase for the purposes of directing gameplay, such as the high-low voice game that mimics the hotter or colder one, but using volume instead to guide the seeker, rather than the words hot or cold. All of these help students to produce language together. Finally, the games in the darker gray area rely the most on memory and individual performance. These act as formative assessments because students show if they can use expressions learned on an individual basis, while allowing for teacher support so that no one fail in any way. It just gives both the teacher and student information about whether the student is just there or not there yet. Let's look at an individual lesson breakdown. I like to break this down for some of the newer teachers in my department by sharing an individual lesson plan checklist for each part of the spectrum. You might recognize these games from the first part of the spectrum. The teacher would segment the class into five minute segments for students in pre-K through second grade and maybe slightly longer segments for three to five. It's very important to segment the lesson particularly when you're repeating the same content because you want to break it up in ways that are fun so the students don't get bored by the review of that same content. Depending on how much content there is, the teacher might need to do these cycles two to three times. So you can see that there's a variety of activities so that two to three days could be planned without repeating from the previous day. It's important to keep games fresh by not repeating any one game too often, especially if it's a student favorite. It's also important to plan for brain breaks. 
These don't need to be elaborate, just anything that involves crossing the medial plane, such as alternately grabbing an ear and pinching a nose with opposite arms across, or a yoga pose. Finally, you will notice space at the bottom for reflection. This disposition is critical to the teacher and student growth, so by including it in our lesson plan, we can ensure it's given some attention. This form gives teachers a quick and easy way to check off what they plan to do for that day and to make sure they have the supplies ready to go. In the transition phase, the teacher is adjusting the instructional activities and evaluating how much more practice, support, or input the students might need in order to feel really comfortable. Note that diagram analysis is not a grammar task, it's more related to Venn diagrams and other graphic organizers. Students in this segment will usually be working together in teams for support. Often, the borrowing of knowledge from the team works to support even the less proficient students as they seek to contribute for the group. Using a rule such that every member must share at least once before anyone does it twice, make sure that everyone is involved. Finally, the output phase. Students are being evaluated here for what they can now do with language. There are some that are not there yet, and the teacher acknowledges those who are celebrating their mastery of content. In my classroom, they're called I Can Kings, and they get their picture taken with a fancy crown, and I turn this into a mini poster that the administration signs with congratulations. I send it home as well as posting it in the classroom to celebrate what they can now do. In using the natural order of questioning throughout these activities, teachers can immediately reduce the burden or increase the challenge for a student, depending on the student's needs at that moment. Let's take a look at some proficiency pathways. I find that it's important to create thematically based proficiency pathways so that students can track their own movement, helping them to understand that they are in charge of their next steps, and with the teacher's coaching will arrive there when they're ready. Here are some examples, but it could be anything related to the theme of your content, as it helps to reinforce the vocabulary related to the image as well as the idea behind the goal setting. I hope that this has been useful to you. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have. Here are some resources to support your teaching and engaging students from input through output.